morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Penner. I'm the president of the Association for Energy Engineers Canada East chapter. And uh, we're really pleased this morning to, to have a webinar uh, about a zero carbon story uh, for a building uh, here in the nation's capital. Um, and, and I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. Uh, let's see here. Before we start, I just wanted to give a kind of give a shout out to the sponsors of our chapter. Um, they're really they're really important uh, for the operation of a chapter like ours, and, and we're really pleased. We have a pretty good stable here, um, and, and they've they've helped us uh, to to build training programs. They've uh, they've helped us to uh, issue uh, uh, give us the opportunity to issue uh, continuing education credits and so on and so forth. So, and, you know, a big shout out to these to these folks. If there are others who, who would like to support a chapter like ours, we're, we're certainly open to, to, to hearing from you and, and adding you to our stable. Um, of course, we are, we are a chapter of the Association of Energy Engineers. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of the base that we've built this thing from um, and, and really focused on energy efficiency, of course. But uh, as you all know, um, we are now, as, a, as an industry, we are now kind of coursing towards uh, the realities of decarbonization. Um, but AEE, AEE gives us the rudder and, uh, and the platform to do this. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this, is, this isn't our first webinar, but, but certainly we wanted to just make a, a bit of a reminder. Um, you know, you're, you, this is, we are in webinar mode. Uh, so it's not like we're all sitting together in a room. Uh, we we can't can't see each other. We can't raise our hands and, and open up and engage in conversation. And I know that's tricky. Uh, it's tricky for the participants and it's tricky for the presenter, to be quite frank. Uh, so what we're, we'd encourage you all to to ask your questions on the fly. Don't hold them to the end. Um, I'll my, myself and and Mark Pacini, who's also on the call, uh, will help to uh, moderate those questions with our presenter. Uh, that way it, it turns it more into a conversation than, than a talking head. Um, I, I know he'd, he'd rather not be a talking head. So please feel free to ask those questions using the Q&A button in your, in your Zoom webinar platform, however that looks. So, you know, before, but without further ado, we're going we're gonna to get rolling and I'm going to invite uh, Mark, Mark Pacini to, to introduce our speaker today. Hey, good morning, everyone. We've got uh, Kevin Spencer here from Modern Niagara. He's the Vice President of Energy Solutions. Kevin has over 30 years of experience with Modern in various roles. He's a licensed heating, refrigeration, and air conditioning tech, a licensed gas fitter, and also a certified energy manager. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Kevin to start his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, Awesome, Kevin. I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, you're going to have the floor. Thank you. You folks can hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Screen sharing's uh, not let me share there, Andrew. There we go. You see that okay? You got the screen up there? The presentation yeah we've got it okay great well you know good good morning everybody and uh and thank you for having me very excited to be here very excited to share this uh this project with everybody on the call here and uh as as andrew and mark said just fire away with any questions happy to share this with a in a, in a collaborative environment and uh yeah as as uh as introduced i am kevin spencer and um like to share this unique project with you that had its share of challenges but these challenges uh certainly led to some lessons for us and uh, we're continuing to learn those lessons and uh we're very we're very proud of this facility and what we've been able to accomplish so uh in december of 2020 last year uh the amped facility was recognized as the first zero carbon performance standard arena by the uh, canadian green building council so today I'm going to share with you uh, just a little bit. I won't bore you too much with uh, Modern Niagara, but just a little bit about who we are for those who may not know us. Um, talk to you a little bit about what the goals of this project were. A uh, little bit of the overview of the building and the technologies applied and what we did. And that's where I uh, would really like to dive into. Uh, there's, some, there's some key concepts there that I'll cover with you. And uh, where we are today with the pandemic has certainly created some challenges for us. 
but uh, certainly made the installation a bit easier because the building wasn't occupied at times and we were able to get some, some installation done. So for those of you that may not know Modern Niagara, we, are, we, we started as a mechanical contractor uh, over 60 years ago. Uh, today we've grown, we are a mechanical electrical contractor. Uh, we do building controls. We are in, in Ontario, Alberta and British Columbia in the major cities, several offices in those provinces. And uh, we're generally known for our business and construction, but we do have a, a very large building services group as well as an energy solutions group, which is the group that, uh, that I lead and that was responsible for, for delivering this project. A little bit about us, we have been uh, focused on energy savings and sustainability for, for a lot of years. Um, you know, some reasons, it, number one, it's the right thing to do. It's good for the environment. And it allows us to work with our, our clients on their, their objectives. So um, the, the AMP project was a, um, I get a lot of questions around, you know, why did, why did the AMP facility do this? Well, we had an owner that was very forward thinking, very uh, conscious about sustainability and the environment and the planet. And as we got speaking with them, uh, we came up with this, this idea. Um, I'll share with you right now, the, the, the cost of this project to date is pushing about $900,000. So it's not a small investment, but uh, we're learning a lot of things about uh, about what we can do in these buildings. Kevin, just a quick question when you're on that, just on that idea, do you, do you see this transition in the early days being one that is, is more altruistic then than it is driven by uh, economics, if you will? Yeah, the, the, the interesting thing about this facility is it was not that old. So, so economically, it did not make a lot of sense. The equipment was not end of life. But what we've learned from doing this is, is if the building was built again from the start, I'm sure it would have been done totally different. That, uh, did that answer your question, Andrew? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it, it was really about, and, and, and one of the things we talked about with the owner, but it was really about talking about what is the art of the possible? What can we do? And, and it was interesting to have a client where you could actually get in a room and brainstorm things that did not come down to, uh, okay, well, we're out of the bottom line by about $10 here. So what are we going to do to adjust for that? It was really about what can we accomplish here? So uh, just, a, just a review, I'm sure most uh, people on this call know about the, uh, the pledges made. Um, I think uh, we're trying to renew some of those pledges with the new government in the US on the south of the border there and uh, in Canada, but we are trying to reduce our, our greenhouse emissions by 30% below the 2005 rates by 2030. And we got a long way to go to get that done. And uh, buildings count, account for 17% of uh, Canada's total greenhouse gas emissions. So just thought I'd throw that in there. And let's get into the, the building itself. So the Amped Sports Lab and Ice Complex was built actually in 2015. So if you think about that, six years, and we've already gone through a complete refit in this building. So give you a kind of uh, an idea into the, the, the vision of the owners of that facility. So the facility focuses on skill development, strength training, physiotherapy, and it's really designed to, to help athletes reach their optimum level of performance. The ice surface itself is not the, uh, not a standard pad. The NH an NHL standard pad size is about 200 feet by, not about, it's 200 feet by 85 feet. And the ice pad in this, this facility is 120 feet by 65 feet. So it really is for, uh, for training. Um, they have things in the in the physio area such as as treadmills that you can actually wear your skates and skate on so it really is, is a real specialized facility um, one of the unique things i want to point out about this facility is if you look at the uh, the panels on the outside of that building those are actually uh very similar to those insulated foam panels that you see on on freezers and refrigerators so we had a very good seal on this building and very good thermal value that you typically don't see to that level on, on buildings of this type. So just a level set when we start talking about the, the energy performance of this building. So our goals, our goals and objectives for this project were uh, number one, we wanted to, to target the lowest energy consumption possible. That's what we always do as energy managers. Um, but we wanted to eliminate all of the fossil fuel consumption on site, which was a big challenge for us because 
we know that costs a lot of money in operating costs. So we, we didn't want to achieve a, a net a zero carbon standard by simply buying carbon offsets or, or even purchasing renewable natural gas. We wanted to get as close to zero carbon as possible in the physical sense of doing that. So um, the project obviously very challenging because arenas and rec facilities are, are very energy intensive buildings and the energy intensity a lot of times comes from the, the ice plant, but also the, 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 the hot water or the heating. So yeah, you need to, you've got showers and, and all of those things. And it's, you know, natural gas is such a great fuel for, for heating things. It's very, uh, a very economical fuel as well. So um, we made the commitment, we went after the project and um, to give you an idea of what we were able to achieve, um, the project decreased from 86 tons of carbon per year to nine tons of carbon per year. So for the remaining, you know, 10% of the carbon, we actually did buy offsets and that was to offset the carbon content of the electrical grid. So what you see in this picture here, that's uh, one of the domestic hot water heaters there on your right being installed. You can see the forms are still on the housekeeping pad. It's not plumbed in yet. Um, and uh, yeah, the, so the, um, the ice rink dehumidifier, which I'll touch on as well, is, is one of the other uh, challenging aspects of this project. Oh, sorry about that. So the technologies we applied in this building. So we, we put on a rooftop solar array. That's pretty, that's pretty standard nowadays. Solar, solar generation is pretty good. Uh, not a bad ROI for solar. Uh, we did evaluate batteries. We didn't do that. It was uh, very expensive to put batteries in the building. So we used the, the grid as the battery and put in a net metering system for that. Um, I just showed you the domestic hot water heater before. They're readily available today. So not much of a, not much of a you know, move forward in technology there. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the LED lighting. So there was already some LED lighting in this building. And one of the things we analyzed and discovered was when we put in a dimmable LED system in some of the areas and we're experimenting with several different lighting manufacturers, I think we have three in there right now. It's interesting that the off cycle or phantom power from some of these LED systems is quite significant. So uh, we actually studied that as well and picked a system that used probably 90% less phantom power than some of the other systems it use for the, for the controllers. Hey, Kevin, there's a, there's a quick question, um, and one, one of one of the participants was just simply asking, um, if are these were these these panels were they existing or did they come in with this project? The solar panels we we put them on with this project. They were part okay. of this project. Yeah. Okay, so they weren't there in the original building. Okay, no. awesome. And then just a quick another quick question. Somebody was asking what the uh, what the size of the array is under. Uh, sorry, what is the max PV array size under net metering? Yeah, we it's a 140 kilowatt solar array that we have there. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. That's okay, no problem. Yep. And Kevin, uh, regarding that phantom power, just curious when you say it was the technology chosen was using 90% less, are we talking the difference between like one watt and 0.1 watts or was it actually a significant wattage difference? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be something, um, we were testing one two foot by two foot LED fixture and, and I'm really stretching the memory here, so don't quote me on this one, but I, I believe it was, something in around that that like the run one watt to, to 0.1 watts like it wasn't a lot of energy but in a large building it could certainly start to add up yeah okay thanks so some of the uh the main things that that, that we where we really pushed the envelope here was was after the lighting so we used a and i'll share some slides on the next uh the next three bullet points here, I have a lot more detail on this to, to discuss and happy to answer all kinds of questions, but the variable refrigerant flow, so the VRF systems that are readily available today, we actually worked with a manufacturer to incorporate that technology and the benefits of that technology into the packaged rooftop units. So that's a, that's a step forward that I think could be very beneficial for, for energy and for, uh, for carbon, that heat sharing. Um, we also took the, the arena dehumidifier, which was natural gas fired and a dry desiccant wheel. And we, we actually custom built a liquid desiccant unit to dehumidify the arena. 
And I've got a few slides on that coming up as well. That's pretty interesting technology. And um, advanced building technology. So building automation, intelligent buildings, smart buildings, whatever we want to call it. Um, we're taking a new approach there as well to try to, to try to drive the carbon and even the service um, more cost effective as well. And, and, and again, so those three bullet points have uh, more information to share with you here today. On the ice plant, uh, the ice plant itself, the energy optimization controls, um, we actually partnered with a, a company called uh, Guest Automation. So Guest Automation is is uh, known for doing ice plant energy optimization. They do a lot of NHL rinks. So rather than try to reinvent the wheel, we, we partnered with anybody we could partner with on this rather than trying to reinvent the wheel ourselves. Hey, Kevin, when you're, when you're, design when you're building the wheel, not reinventing it, but building the wheel of this project, um, how much, one, one of the participants was just simply asking, you know, what, were, there a, were there a whole lot of meters already? Was a building submetered a lot? And did and did da data help factor into some of the decisions on technology that, that you guys made? Uh, absolutely, and fantastic question, by the way. So we went through almost one year of uh, analysis prior to to implementing the the technologies. So we spent we held off on putting technologies in for about probably about fourteen months. And what we did was we put metering in right down to the circuit breaker and disconnect level. So we have very detailed energy monitoring. And yes, we use that data to target technologies and where we think we could save. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Since we're on that process, I was just curious, uh, like what kind of team was put together? Was there like a design charrette or how did all these ideas come into play? Did they just rely on yourselves or did you put a team together or how did that work? It was primarily an internal, but we did, we did work with a, um, with a consultant on the electrical side. So the net metering side and the design for the electrical, we worked with an exterior consultant. Um, any subject matter experts that are business partners of ours, ours we brought in, but, but specifically, yes, we had a lot of brainstorming design charrettes and design workshops where we, we constantly challenged ourselves and we, we constantly pivoted as well. So we'd, we'd come up with an idea and say, no, that's, we shouldn't be doing that. Let's go over here and, uh, and, and coming up even with a decision such as let's find out a way to sh just shut the natural gas service off to this building. So yeah, a lot, lot of that took place and that uh, a lot of that we did during the metering stage because we had a year to think about this as we were gathering the data. And the more we looked at the data, we would pivot some more again. And, and Kevin, was the metering limited to electricity or did you also meter mechanicals? Did yeah, we metered use? electricity yeah. and natural gas. So we okay. knew what the rooftops were using for natural gas, what the dehumidifier was using for the natural gas, the domestic water heating. So yes, we targeted all of those. Okay. And so it was, it was the energy inputs. Did, did you also get down to the, B, like measuring BTUs, for instance, on, on uh, water flows or? No, we did not go to that depth. We, we were trying to figure out where the gas and, and the electricity was being consumed. Yeah. More of a triage, more of a triage oh, approach. Yes. Yeah. yeah, right on. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. So yeah, a little bit more detail. Um, this might be re re repetition for people that know the VRF technology very well, but uh, VRF technology has been around for a while. It was, it's, really, it's really popular in Europe and Asia. And um, our, our office actually that I'm sitting in right now, I have a VRF cassette in my ceiling here. We did our entire office with a VRF system. So um, this technology, we work with uh, LG to custom design a system and you'll see in the in the photo there, and the you'll see the condensers in the top left picture, and the bottom right is one of the custom air handlers. So, believe it or not, we actually built that air handler ourselves at Modern and put the coils in from LG, and we did put electric backup heat into those units as well, because as you may or may not know, as you get down to about you know minus twenty five, minus thirty, the heat content in these in these refrigerated heat pump systems is not uh, is not enough to maintain the heat in the building. So the technology itself for VRF, they're very efficient because they're variable capacity compressors, but, but not only that, there's a heat recovery option available so you can do simultaneous heating and cooling. And again, I apologize if this is a repetition for many people, but in this example, we could have our, uh, you know, our, our lobby in heating mode where everybody comes into the facility. We may have some office space on the perimeter in heating mode. Well, at the same time, there could be people working at the gym and they need cooling. Well, that cooling unit 
is, is essentially getting its, it's absorbing its heat for, for no charge because we're taking that and putting it into the other areas for the cost of moving a little bit of refrigerant around and moving some air. So that's where we get a, a lot better efficiency. And I, I point out on the right there that natural gas, if you look at it for a straight heat pump without heat recovery compared to natural gas, at today's prices, and, and it has changed much in two months, I'll be off a little bit, but natural gas about 42% more cost effective to heat with than a heat pump. So even with that, we are still targeting uh, energy savings. Okay, so I don't know about everybody on the call, but I, I love starting to look at energy. So I don't have the electrical graphs for you, but I, I did wanna show you here in an arena when you look at the base case, you'll notice that the, the gas consumption, for instance, in December is, um, is pretty low compared to the summer. And that is for the dehumidifier. That is really that dehumidifier that's, that's removing the moisture from the rink. So uh, pretty, pretty good EUI in this facility. Um, we were at 27.09 before we started this project was a little bit below the Energy Star median. Um, about 40% of the gas was going to the rink dehumidifier in the showers. And um, the $1,500 increase in that 42% of uh, uh, extra for heating, we believe we're going to offset that not just through VRF heat recovery, but through some of the other automation and some of the other measures that we put in that I'll, that I'll talk to you about here today. So we still have a target to reduce the, the ener total energy consumption in this facility by 10 to 20 percent a year and that does not include the energy offset by the solar array so we're imagining if the solar array wasn't there we're still going to try to get this building down 10 to 20 percent so fairly just, fairly aggressive target there yeah just just a just a quick question i think it, it it's um it, it fits nicely on this this slide because you've got all the months there that the rink operates all year round is that correct? correct? The, the ice is there all the time. Okay. Correct. Uh, and then and some, another another participant is asking is just just if you could confirm what the units of your e, EUI are. Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, that is uh, equivalent kilowatt hours per. See, what is that now? Equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot, I believe. That makes sense to Andrew. I'd have to, I'd yeah. have to look that up. I, for some reason that I should have that up there, but I think it's, uh, I think it's kilowatt hours, equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot, I believe. Yeah. That, makes, probably, <clears throat> that makes sense based on the number. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, or square meters probably in this case, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Energy mm -hmm. prairie. If it was square meters, it, you'd be in the hundreds. So I yeah. Square feet. Yeah. yeah square feet. Good. Okay. Yeah. Square feet. Yeah. yeah very sorry. good. Thanks guys. Okay, well, let's dive into some of the cool stuff here. So this is uh, this is our liquid desiccant dehumidifier. Now, li liquid desiccant is nothing new. Liquid desiccant has been around for a long time. Liquid desiccant is essentially a salt solution. So um, we know that we know that um, arenas require dehumidification, so you don't get fog in the arena and and and, and uh, condensation on the glass. It's all about maintaining that dry uh, dew point. So a little bit, and that is actually a picture of the uh, center of the liquid desiccant unit that we built. I wanted to talk to you about a little bit about dehumidification. Um, when dehumidifying, um, there's there's three ways I want to talk to you about dehumidifying. One is the cooling with reheat. So if we take um, if we take a temperature or, a, or a, sorry a, a air property around you know 22 degrees and 60 percent RH, and we pick a target. So let's try to get that down to 35% RH. With a cooling and reheat system, as we probably all know, you cool down the air to the dew point, you, you condense the moisture out of the air, and then you need to reheat that air. And that can either be done with reheat in the unit or it can dump into the space where it's reheated. With a dry desiccant wheel, um, the wheel absorbs the moisture but you've just heated up the wheel to drive the, the moisture out of it. So that, that wheel is very warm. So we're heating that, that air up as well. We would dump that air back into the arena. And then we'd actually put that, that load, that heat load that we just put in the air onto the ice plant itself. With a, with a liquid desiccant system, you can do that in one step by controlling the moisture content of the liquid desiccant and the temperature of the liquid desiccant. 
you can actually make that that uh, jump in one step. And if you get it right, it'll save you significant energy. So this is my attempt at drawing a liquid desiccant system for you. So please, uh, please forgive me. Um, the one thing I did miss in here that I that I realized about uh, a month ago, but didn't redraw it was I didn't put fans in. So let's pretend they're external, even though they're not. So um, the fluid losing these, used in these systems, as I said, is a salt based solution. It's either lithium chloride, um, calcium chloride, which is commonly known as ice melting salt. You can use lithium bromide. So we use lithium chloride mostly because that's what has been typically used for desiccant for, for over 50 years. Um, it's safe. We're dumping this into a space where people are skating around on the arena and breathing this in. So it's already, it's already um, proven itself to be safe over, over several years. And these solutions have excellent um, hydroscopic properties, which was a new word for me, hydroscopic, which is their ability to, to uh, attract and hold moisture. The main drawback with these systems is that they're salt-based. And as we all know, salt corrodes materials such as, such as iron, copper, stainless steel. So you need to use alternative materials such as plastics, fiberglass. And we actually built the shell out of titanium ourselves just because on a one-off titanium made the most uh, cost-effective sense. Um, think of it as, as two cooling towers side by side. We built this in one unit. So the, the fluid sprays over a media, we used a cooling tower media and moisture eliminators, um, and it comes into direct contact with the air. So on the left side of this diagram, you'll see air coming in from the arena, goes through the absorber, and the absorber absorbs the moisture from the, from the air going through it. And as it absorbs moisture, the liquid level increases and the floats increases in the bottom of the unit. As the fluid level increases, we know we're absorbing moisture. So we need to reject that moisture on the regen side, which is the right side of the, the diagram here. And we will heat that fluid up to play with the properties of the fluid and bring outdoor air through it and reject that moisture to the outdoors. So hey, Kevin, just, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, you know, you've got a, a heat pump here yeah. acting as your, as your heat source. One of the one of the participants was curious what what temperature what temperature you need to operate uh, operate that uh, that exchange at. Yes, we're trying. So on the on the hot side, we, in the summer, we need to get that up to about 110 degrees that fluid to be able to drive the moisture out of it. And then at the same time, we use the evaporator, so the low side of the system, to to actually because we're you know, as we're heating it with a heat pump, you've got this cooling source. So we just cool the fluid back down on the, on the arena side so that we're not putting as much heat into the arena as uh, only the heat that we have to into the arena. And so, so at these temperatures, did it, did it drive you to make, to, to choose a heat, a heat pump solution, you know, specifically, or, or was, you know, was the whole market open to you? Yeah, we, we went with the heat pump because really the whole, the whole control, this, this system is controlled around the regenerator side. So it's, it's opposite. We had to, you have to change your way of thinking because the heat pump is used as a heater. What we're real, all we're really using it for is to heat up the fluid on the regenerator, the outdoor air side to drive the moisture out. Okay. So that's our control point. Okay. And you're, you're talking in Fahrenheit or degrees in t when you're talking about temperature. I'm talking about Fahrenheit. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Awesome. Oh, that's sorry. okay. Yeah. I, got, I should show my gray hair and then you'll know what's going <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, and that, that's, that's in a nutshell, that's the simplistic, happy to answer any questions about that, but that is the simplistic description of the system. It is one of the most basic technologies out there, been around for a lot of years. Um, the only reason we did a custom built unit for this is because it's a small facility and to go out to a company like, uh, like at uh, Cathabar that is manufactured by Alpha Lavelle, who's been doing this for a lot of years. Um, the system was so small that it was cost prohibitive. It just made a lot more sense for us just to put something together ourselves. Hey, Kevin, is there an opportunity to bypass the system if the, if the outdoor air is dry, is dry enough or does, does all the air have to go through here? Um, we haven't evaluated that yet. Um, mostly because of the temperature difference, like, okay. 
it really needs its de dehumidification in the summer. And you can imagine your ring temperature and the outdoor temperature, you know, with all those properties. So typically we keep it separate, but we never did look at that, to be honest with you. Okay, cool. So the, the third technology that I'd like to talk to you about is, um, you know, we know that uh, there's all kinds of data analytic systems, you know, energy optimization systems, fault detection systems available today. So one of the things we challenged ourselves with was what if we could manage all of these systems together and have them all working together so that the building itself was more autonomous and the building generated calls to action. And, and what I mean about that, one of the things that always frustrated me was I watched the technology advancement in our automobiles, but we seem to still do the same thing in buildings that we've done. And, and I am not talking about necessarily all buildings, but the vast majority of buildings, we still, send a service tech there four times or six times a year. And you're depending on the, the human element of that technician to do all the right things while they're there. Is there not a way that we can automate some of these things? You know, if you think about if, if we're driving, if you're driving a car, that's you know, not more than five years old today, you know, most vehicles tell us when they need attention. You think about your, your, you know, your oil change monitoring systems, your tire pressure monitoring systems, we can get instantaneous fuel economy today, you know, so we'd like to build that all into the equipment level and manage those facilities. Um, and we believe that's a bit of a road too ahead of us. So um, just a, just a visual here. So taking, taking all of those things into account, looking at the weather, doing predictive forecasting, you know, really playing with all the part load things that we can do now that we have these systems on the, on our liquid desiccant system, the compressor is a digital scroll. So we can vary that the VRFs are all variable. So now that we have these technologies, let's use them in the most efficient cost effective way we can. So we've called this facility performance management labeled it that just because we, we want to change the way we manage the facility based on the performance data that we're getting back from it. So that was, that was why we, uh, we coined it facilities performance management. And um, we are working together with system vendors. We're not reinventing everything else. We want to be able to plug in fault detection, diagnostic systems, all of these things. And, and at the end of the day, the benefit for something like this is, you know, obviously it saves energy. It saves time for the clients, saves money, lowers the total cost of ownership and allows them really to focus on their core business and allow, you know, us in the market to control the technical things or not control, but to, to manage their technical aspects of the building to drive what the, the outcomes and results are that they're looking for, right? Reduce unplanned downtime, emergency repairs, breakdowns, all of those things. And, and one of the other things I like to point out too is what if we can reduce the truck rolls by 50%? Think about the, the impact on the environment just by, you know, not putting a fully equipped service truck, burning gasoline or burning whatever down to the site for 50% of the year. So um, we're just starting down this path. We have three buildings. One of them is ours, three buildings that we're piloting with this, trying to knit all that together. And we figure we've got about another year on this ourselves to, to try to figure this out. No questions there. So part of this project and with the technology and everything that's going on, you know, um, as we all know, the client says, oh, it's great. I have all these technologically advanced systems that are unique and one of a kind. Now I'm left holding the bag. No, they're not. So what, what we've done as part of the agreement is modern Niagara is, is guaranteeing the outcomes and the results of all these initiatives. That's where, that's our contribution to this project for the client for Amp Sports Lab. And um, we've taken a fully comprehensive approach. Um, I'm not fully aware what the final contract price is yet. Otherwise, I'd share that with you. But um, we are doing not just full comprehensive maintenance, but we are managing all of the energy, all of the systems, all the technical systems in the building. And um, the goal of everything we're doing is to reduce the carbon footprint and lower the energy consumption. So that's why we feel this is such an important part. It's, it's, you know, the continuous commissioning and, and the service and the management all wrapped into one. Hey, Kevin, that, that guarantee, I mean, that, that's a, that's a great concept. You know, I've, I've often thought that having all 
you know, all the players at the table having skin in the game, as it were, is key to having projects like this that are complex be successful. Um, yes. so, so the guarantee you're talking about, I, I presume that that's tied entirely to the servicing contract, like, or because this isn't a, wasn't a performance wasn't a performance based project, was it? For, from the get go, um, it's not performance based. We did we did um, we did tell the client that we would get them the the net zero carbon certification that we would get them to that point, and then the real it was really around you know this you, you think of this liquid desk and technology and think you know I've seen this stuff before. Eighteen months from now, you got a you got a hunk of scrap metal sitting outside the building there that you know, contractors have generally washed their hands off. It's not ours. We have, we have guaranteed the client. We will look after that. We will make it right. That is the risk on us. That is the, it's actually a value proposition to us internally as well, because we're learning from this and we have a real live building to learn from. So that's where our contribution is. Okay. And do you see like this, this notion of, of again, taking some responsibility and being an active player in the project, was that, was that key for getting uh, amped to, to, to agree to allow you to do this to their, what would otherwise be considered a pretty brand new facility or, or yes. is this just kind of like a, uh, where, where you're establishing yourself in the marketplace with this as a value piece? No, no, we've been, we've been trying to move. We've been trying to move in this direction for a while. It's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like takes a bit from the ESCO model, but also, you know, you look at the, you look at the contracting model when we the typically way we go with consultant, engineer, contractor, and then the service provider at the end of the day can have absolutely no awareness of what, how this whole thing started and what the objectives and, and, and outcomes that we were looking for are. So we see not for every building, but we see an opportunity for, for, for all of us really to change the game a little bit for the client to benefit the client. So if you think about, you think about municipal procurement on, on ice arenas, what if, imagine, imagine a municipality going out where they would ask you to submit a proposal where the financial ROI and the environmental ROI were evaluated together and you had to submit a proposal to, to achieve the, the, the objectives that that municipality was trying to achieve. It's a, it's a really unique process that takes the traditional process that we're all used to and really spins it around and flips it on its head and says, Hey, if you don't accomplish the objectives you said you'd accomplish, you're not getting paid. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great model. I'd, I'd love to see the market get, get there. I mean, I think um, in, in my experience working on federal government buildings, you know, I, I can see that, that they're moving in that direction, not, not so much on the guarantee side or the handshake, but certainly in evaluating environmental objectives consistently with your financial objectives. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that's a good segue into a, a couple of other questions that have been kind of floating around our question and answer box here that I was waiting for the right time to ask. And so, so people are asking about the net present value, like, is this a positive net present value kind of a project and, and, and paybacks and such. Um, so maybe you could kind of speak to that. Like, is, is this project positive from a financial perspective over the long haul? And, and perhaps what, what window did you evaluate that over five years, 10 years, 25 years or yeah, we, we started doing that. And then th this whole carbon pricing and, you know, is carbon pricing really going to be $170 a ton in 2030? So as you start to, as you start to model these things out over the years, you, you really have to start guessing at what the market's going to be. We don't know what the market's going to be in five years, never mind 2030 right now. So uh, to answer your question, we did not do net present value. We did not look at that or do a financial analysis in any way. The, the driver was primarily around, we know we're going to a, a lower carbon economy eventually. Let's see what we can do to get there today. And then we're doing more of a post-financial analysis on this, on this project with the okay. client in partnership with the client. So, and that's been, that's been very challenging for us with the pandemic because um, as we've discussed with people before you, if, if we did a M and V last year, we would have come out smelling like roses, right? Because the building wasn't occupied. So 
we've really got to get this pandemic behind us, get the building occupied and then do proper M and V. So I, I'm hoping we can have that done sometime next year because we do want to hit a few seasons in this. Uh, that, that part of it is a bit frustrating for us because we'd like to, we'd like to have that information today. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, I mean, I, you've touched on something really interesting. Like, essentially, it sounds to me like the project was was sold and justified to the owner based on short-term energy savings and, and the reality that they are going to operationally save dollars, um, but not on a like on a full life cycle assessment. Do I understand that correctly? That's that's correct. It was really the it was really the driver to carbon zero. Um, we had we had uh, we had actually agreed with the client to do this before um, Amazon came out and said with the Seattle Kraken is going to be the first uh, net zero carbon arena. And uh, we were actually having a bit of a chuckle internally because we thought, oh, look at little old us with our little mini pad arena here. And uh, but it, it kind of gave us some some comfort knowing that listen, another arena, a big NHL arena in Seattle wants to do the same thing. We're actually doing something that is good to do and that we should be doing because it does help. It, it, we are, we are moving in the right direction, right? I think I could speak for probably many people on the, that are listening in today to say that we should all be so lucky to have a client who is oh. engaged like that, because I think most of us are faced with other, other realities, right? Where the, where the finances are key to driving the project. So that, I mean, that's, that's great. Yeah, and, and I, I I will say as well, I'm 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 a very fortunate person because I get to, I get to work with a great client, and also with a great company that's willing to take on the risk and let us, you know, let's face it, we're we're this is a real enjoyable part of our career, right? Because we get to in a bit of an R and D environment. Like, when have we ever had a project we could do a little bit of R and D on? So yeah, it was very exciting for us. Awesome. Maybe I'll you know segue back to the to the slide. The slide's all about servicing. And somebody was just asking if there's if there's guaranteed uptimes in in your service contract, or does that does that factor in? Um, no, we have not actually given guaranteed uptimes in our service contract. Okay. However, we have um, 100% redundancy on on heating. So we did size the electric heaters in the rooftop equipment to take the full load of the building just in case, and. Um, Currently we have, we're trying to make a decision on when to shut the gas off because we currently have the arena dehumidifier still in place there. They're gonna both be in parallel for a little bit here before we pull out the natural gas one. Cause we weren't, we weren't able to test the liquid desiccant unit in a, in a cold environment like the ice rink. We only tested in an air in, with 70 degree hum, humid air. Um, we have had that system running, removing 28 pounds per hour already so we we did oversize the unit just as a safety factor and and obviously as i mentioned it is variable so we can vary the capacity but we had that thing running full out absorbing 28 pounds per hour for five hours straight okay so great there's, there's a few other there's a few other questions here and, yeah. and i um mostly related to the interconnection of systems within the facility so you know, as, as we were chatting before the webinar started today, you know, Kevin, we, we were remarking to each other about how, you know, this, this sort of, uh, this sort of project works really, really, or lends itself really well to uh, facilities that are, that are multi-use in a sense and have, have different load profiles and different needs. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the interconnection of the ice plant to the building on this project, if you did or didn't do it and, and perhaps why? Yeah, so we did not tie the ice plant into the building. We really wanted to, and I'll, and I'll, I'll explain that. Uh, we, did, we did do some things, the ice plant itself, as I mentioned, with, bro, with uh, guest, guest automation with the um, you know, VFD on the cooling tower. Like they, they didn't have a VFD on the cooling tower, but the heat that you get off an ammonia ice chiller, um, there's a high temperature heat and then and then a low temperature heat and the amount of the quantity of heat you get at that high temperature is very low so you can get on a, on on this particular system we could get a, a fair bit of heat but it was lower temperature heat so only available not available for domestic water only available for heating maybe a pool which we didn't have or um we thought about things like heating the big lobby area but because it was a retrofit, it just didn't make any sense to, to put in that infrastructure 
for something that would really never, never pay back, you know, 100 year payback or whatever it is. Now, if it was a new build, absolutely, we would have done that. And we probably would have evaluated putting a CO2 chiller in because the the quantity, the, the quality of the heat you can get off a CO2 chiller of, of high temperature heat is is uh, is better than an ammonia or, or certainly the ammonia system that we have there today. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. And just, just to confirm, like the domestic hot water <clears throat> system, is that being driven off the heat pump, heat pump energy exchange? Yeah, it's a, it's a packaged heat pump domestic water heater. So there's a heat pump on top of it, takes the heat out of the room. And, and we have done things like where we put the domestic hot water uh, heat pump. We have the heat from the electrical vault and everything else blowing into that room. So the heat pump can use that, that heat in order to heat the, the domestic hot water for showers and washrooms and things. Awesome. Awesome. And then, and then in true via VRF fashion, <clears throat> I presume that if there's an abundance of heat, it just goes to the atmosphere. That's the. Yeah. Methodology. Yeah. Through the outdoor unit. Yeah. yeah. I, have a, I have another question um, actually related to the VRF system. <clears throat> I work on the, on federal government buildings and if anybody's paying attention to what the federal government says uh, in their greening statements, et cetera, you know, they made, they made an announcement not so long ago, uh, you know, that they were looking to, to get rid of HFCs in their buildings for a couple of reasons, uh, and primarily driven because of the global warming potential of those refrigerants. Uh, what, what refrigerant is being used in your VRF system? And, and, you know, as an extension to that, you know, does, did, did, does the, um, the zero carbon standard or, or does your, Kind of project accounting on greenhouse gases take into account fugitive emissions on that or no the the, the way that i don't believe so anyways as uh, so i should i should qualify that um i don't believe the refrigerant it is 410 um r410 i don't believe that factored in i i myself am looking forward to the day when co2 systems become more mainstream so we can use a natural refrigerant but I don't know how far away that is. I know they're working on smaller systems, the, you know, the Emerson's of the world and, and everybody else, but uh, yeah, it'll be exciting when we can get those. Okay. And, and, you know, using VRF, you know, I've heard, I've heard different people have different anxiety about, about refrigerant running through their occupied spaces. Yeah. Does, did, did that give, give your client any heartburn or, or was that, is it just kind of like, Hey, we, we, we trust that the workmanship is there to ensure that refrigerant isn't going to fugitively leak into our occupied space. Yeah. That's, that's come up on other projects that did not come up on this project. Okay. And, and really it's just the, uh, the coils inside the rooftop units that are exposed to the indoor environment, all the other piping and everything else is okay. on the roof. So, okay. Uh, so you're uh, lucky in this case, given the type of facility that you're able to run all that outside anyways. So it's, you know, I think, when you think of um, other other buildings, um, office type to office type buildings, when those tubes are running through the plenum spaces, yes. for instance, you know, yeah, they're outside my office here above the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, and and, and then you still come into the office. That's there you go. That's a, a testament. Yeah, it's you know, being a refrigeration guy all my life, it's usually if you're going to get a get a leak in a refrigeration pipe, it's going to happen in the first year. You know, otherwise it'll be a mechanical fitting or something like that. It's um, that is one of the with VRF systems. That is one of the hardest things to to get across to a client or somebody that's 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 you know purchasing these systems is. It's not like you're putting in a five ton split system anymore. You're putting in a pretty technologically advanced refrigeration system with a lot of you know small openings and orifices, and there have been cases where contractors have not purge with nitrogen to get the carbon content down and, and the whole system can get messed right up if you don't follow stringent installation practices. So that, that would be my biggest piece of advice to everybody is if you're putting in VRF systems, you got to be doing it properly. Otherwise you are absolutely going to have problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, I think it probably goes without saying, but it's yeah. nice to hear, it's, it's nice to hear it from the horse's mouth as it were. And and I know, I know with your background, Kevin, like you, you, you were on the tools, so you understand this better than most. Right. So I, I think that's, uh, it's coming from a strong place for sure. Yeah. Another, another question, Kevin, uh, related to emission accounting, uh, you know, what kind of backup power system is, is at this facility? Uh, we, we did, we actually ended up putting nothing in. We were, okay. we were looking at putting, um, batteries in at one time. I think I might've mentioned that, but we decided, you know what? Backup power is not an issue for this facility. Okay. 
So they didn't have one even before you came, like no no, no gen, diesel gen set or anything. Okay. No. Okay. No. Awesome. So I've got I've got just a couple more here for you, but um, yeah, we talked about the electrical meters that we put in prior, um, you know, and, and that once the facility is back to 100, percent we'll do the M and V. Um, we'll do the continuous development improvement. Um, we are going to work with organizations such as AE Canada East and the Canadian Green Building Council, and and we want to feed back all of that information we have on the uh, continuous improvement and all the post project M and V as well. Um, it's just, again, with the pandemic, it's taken us a, a while here. So, and um, lots of time for questions here, but I'd like to, I'd like to conclude, I already give a shout out to the client and our, and our visionary CEO, but I, I do like this quote um, from our CEO, Brad McIninch, that says, you know, recognizing that every building is unique and the path to zero carbon is also unique. So if we can do what we've done in a, in a facility where temperatures vary by, you know, a significant 40 degrees, think of what we can do in other buildings around Canada, and around the world. So that was, uh, that was the uh, art of the possible that we were trying to achieve, achieve and accomplish. That's awesome. So, so, so as, yeah. as, yeah, thank you very much. So as Kevin said, there's still, still a fair bit of time. <clears throat> we, we, we have on the schedule until quarter after quarter after the hour, just to give time for questions and, uh, for people and i know we we asked a lot of kevin along the way but i think yeah i kind of like i kind of liked the flow that way oh it's way better than especially in the webinar like you said at the start you know there's nothing worse than just going through an entire presentation yeah. i like the uh i like the interactive so happy to answer any questions at all awesome so so one of the participants is actually asking is uh, real time are you guys using real time electricity pricing in any of your decision making uh well like for operations no, so, not in this facility. The, the, the energy consumption in this facility is not that great. So there wouldn't be much benefit to doing that in this, okay. in this example. Okay. And just for, just to give the, the people who are watching a, a sense of scale for those who are, are perhaps not local and, and haven't driven by this facility. I, I drive by it because I, I live pretty close to it, but um, oh. yeah, about how big, about how big is, is this facility like from, from a floor space perspective? I believe, oh, I'm taking a while. I should know that one off the top of my head, shouldn't I? I think we're around uh, 50 or 60,000 square feet. Okay. Okay. We can probably work backwards from that EUI. But... Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking, Mark, but I couldn't do the math that quick. Get your calculator out, Mark. <laughs> yeah. But on, on that point earlier about, uh, you know, performance based projects too, like that's what energy performance contracts do, except the main driver being the payback. So, yes. You really just, you are held to your, uh, you know, to your goals or to your commitments. Yeah. And if the facility does not perform as, as promised, then, you know, you do have to cut a check back to the customer. But I guess what you were saying is, uh, you know, maybe having environmental targets as well, which is, it's similar to energy reduction targets, I guess. But uh, yeah. And I, I think we, we may see a bit of a shift where you'll have both of those in, in place, Mark, in the, as, as we get closer to this 2030, like I personally don't know what's going to happen, but I, I can see this push. I can see, you know, more carbon-based incentives coming out as, as we get closer to 2030. If you think about it, yeah, you know, we, we've just lost, we're, we're going to lose almost two years here because of the pandemic on, on driving towards our 2030 and 2050 goals. So. Yeah, and and like uh, like Andrew was saying about the uh, the greening government, they're they're actually they they've committed to using a shadow price of three hundred dollars per ton because you were mentioning the one seventy. You don't know if that's going to be there by twenty thirty, but uh, you know I think they're using three hundred. So the one seventy, yeah. I think, is the more conservative assumption. Okay. That being said, uh, you know none of the you know the projects that are out now are actually using the three hundred dollars per ton in the payback calculation, they yep. just want analysis done with that price in mind, just so that they know, you know, how the project looks, I guess, maybe in terms of NPV. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so I can confirm that it actually is, we are using it in the, in the, in the life cycle costing um, uh, analysis. It, it's not a, it's not a true project cost. Of course, it doesn't hit mm -hmm. the books per se, but it is definitely 
driving decision making within the federal government. And, and the reason really is, is because there's a recognition out there that there, there, there needs to be a cost to not doing it, right? Because they, they recognize if you, if, you know, as, as an organization, if you've made a commitment to decarbonizing, if you don't decarbonize at the asset level, eventually you're going to have to do it by, by absorbing out of the atmosphere or, or paying for somebody else to do that. So I, I think that's, that's really the driver behind the federal government stance on the shadow cost of carbon. Of course, you know, I, I know that there, you know, there are di- different jurisdictions within this country have, have different carbon prices, true and real carbon prices attached to carbon. So, I mean, it, it definitely needs to be part of your ROI, your ROI calculation. Yeah. And, and there was a paper, I don't know if uh, everybody's seen it or not. That I saw, I just saw it last year very briefly, but it was something to the effect of that the federal government is going to get preferential treatment starting in 2027 for low carbon buildings when they're renewing their leases. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. They're a big uh, land. They're a big uh, tenant. There's, there's one question here on uh, they're asking if the ice resurfacer is electric. And uh, I guess as a second point to that, you know, there's that, uh, you know, real ice technology, I think is one specific manufacturer. I don't know if there's more of a generic term for that, but, you know, using cold water to resurface ice are either of those. Uh, yeah, they, they actually have an electric Zamboni and they're doing cold water flooding as well, which is, okay. a, uh, which when you talk to the ice people, I don't know if anybody's talked to ice people about cold water flooding, but boy, you want to, you want to talk about conspiracy theories. It gets everybody riled right up. So I, I'm not in <laughs> I'm not into that at all. I have no idea of of how it impacts. And and there are definitely two very strong schools of thought on that. So they have, they have a system there called the Deox system. The person that runs the ice there loves it. They have, they have several NHL players that train there at that facility from the senators. And the feedback is they love the ice. They think the ice is quality ice is fantastic, but I've had some, pretty heavy hitters on the phone and you'd say bring up cold water flooding and and they just want to you know that snake oil to them hmm. yeah because it's really the the heating process is really i think to remove the uh the oxygen from the the water before you flood the ice with it isn't it i, I, I again i i mark i've heard that's that's uh i know enough to be dangerous and start a fight between the people but uh i don't yeah. i don't really know you know whether the the warm fluid bonds better but they the feedback we get from Amped is they love it. The, the people there love it. The, the ice, uh, the ice technician, whatever, whatever that title is, sorry, uh, yeah. loves it. And the people on the ice think that the ice quality is fantastic. So that's, those are the facts I have, but there's a lot of negativity out there with cold water flooding systems. It's good to hear. Yeah. I've looked at them for my projects. I haven't uh, actually installed one yet, but maybe the one I was mentioning to you earlier, that one might be a good candidate. Yeah. Uh, another one, I guess, you know, to follow what, you know, I guess Andrew had posed earlier about uh, time of use pricing and stuff, but I know you don't do that, but is there any, uh, you know, peak uh, avoidance strategies with the BAS to avoid equipment coming on at the same time? Is there anything like that happening? Yeah, we are, we are going to, we haven't implemented that yet. That is part of our, you know, continuous commissioning. And what we're really hoping is that, um, you know, the basics of mother nature when it's sunny and hot and the air conditioning load is pretty high and the ice plant load is pretty high. That's when we're hoping to get the maximum production out of the solar array as well to keep that peak down. Okay. Uh, somebody else is asking about DHW, uh, you know, heat pumps for DHW, the, their concern, the temperature might not be high enough to avoid Legionella, but I know there's, you know, there's, there's heat pump water heaters specifically designed for that. So they, I think they, they can raise the temperature a bit higher than a, a traditional, you know, heat pump or air conditioner beyond that hundred Fahrenheit. They, they go to what, maybe 130, 140 Fahrenheit or. Yeah. Yeah. They cut, we, the water heaters are set for 140 or, or higher, but they, they do heat the water to 140 and um, it is a package unit available right from uh, right from the manufacturer today. Yeah, and just for the person asking, I think they were saying 75C to kill Legionella, but uh, I didn't think it was that high, is it? Isn't it, you have to keep it above, uh, you know, the 40s, the 50s uh, Celsius? You guys, are, you guys are killing me with the Celsius. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. I, I, know, I, know it's, I know it's 140, sorry. Um, you want to keep it below, you want to keep it above 120, sorry. I think when you get below 120, you get into some risky. Exactly territory right yeah 
Yeah, that, yeah. That, is, that is actually one of the reasons we decided to go with a package CSA certified unit is because we didn't want to be, you know, responsible for that on the technology and the design side. Okay. Kevin, do you know, is there, is there like an electric resistance heater in that package as a boost or is it all heat pump? It's all heat pump. And I think we have three of them there. So we do have some redundancy. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. It's just heat pump alone. We actually, we actually came across the, um, I was fortunate enough a couple of years uh, to get to visit the, um, the Rocky Mountain Institute. And I got a, I got a tour with Amory Lovins through his house there. And, and um, that's when we saw at the Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado, they have all heat pump water heaters for all their domestic everywhere. And uh, I, I quizzed them pretty heavily on them before we made that purchase. <laughs> As you, it's, it's just located inside the building, right? So it's just using the ambient, um, exactly. chillier, the ambient temperatures, the heat sink, I guess. And yeah. So you'll reject your heat into the building in the summer and absorb heat in the winter from it. Yeah, so we're we're trying to put all of our all of our heat sources from our mechanical and electrical rooms into that heat pump room as well, and then there is an electric uh, unit heater in that room as well. We're hoping we never have to bring that on, but it is there just in case. If there's not enough waste heat, yeah, and in the summer, it wouldn't the the fact that you're rejecting heat in there is not a big deal because you probably just have an exhaust fan to when it gets exactly. too or something, right? Yeah. Exactly, and we can divert it to outside if the room does get too warm as well. Yeah. Uh, what's one here on the refrigerant detection? Is there a refrigerant detection system for the, the VRF? Not for the VRF, no, no. But there yeah. is, there is for the ammonia, but uh, the chiller plant, but not the VRF, no. Yeah, it'd be hard because there's pipes going all over, right? Like, I guess you could have one at the unit. Is there an alarm? There's probably a low uh, refrigerant alarm at the unit or something, right? Yeah, these VRF systems have very, very um, complex and deep analytics in them. They'll tell you when something's wrong with the system. And, okay. and we've, we've mined with the manufacturer, we mine into all that data from our system as well, our supervisory system to, to manage and monitor all that. Okay. So I was asking about the, uh, the EUI that, you know, you have that EUI in that, you know, 20, I think you were showing, oh no, your targets around 20 right now. I think you started with 27. That's right. So they're saying with a target of around 20 and, uh, you know, the square footage of 50,000, let's say, if that's what it is, you've got a total of around a million equivalent kilowatt hours. You've got 140 kilowatt solar array, which should give you around 200,000 kilowatt hours per year. Sounds a little bit high to me. I thought it was around 11 or 1200 uh, hours, you know, full of equivalent hours. But and regardless, uh, they're asking what's the, the mechanism for hitting the net zero carbon. I think you mentioned it at the beginning, right? It's uh, carbon offsets to offset the uh, electrical grid carbon intensity. Is that right? Yeah, you do have to, you do have to offset um, for any carbon that you cannot eliminate. So yes, we had to buy, we had to buy offsets. I think the, um, yeah, it was nine. I think we had to pay for nine tons of offsets a year. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, so that's, that's a really great question. And certainly one that, that, would uh, would be would warrant some different additional exploration, especially given that our chapter spans, you know, Ontario, a little bit of Ontario through Quebec into the Maritimes, and it, it, and I think it it's occurring to me that perhaps this conversation, if this project were in another jurisdiction, Kevin, one that had you know a higher carbon content of electricity, for instance, <laughs> like, you know, Nova per- like Nova Scotia, right? Perhaps perhaps some of the decisions that you made for this project would change. Or, right, or, or your strategy. So I guess that all kind of falls back to all that, that work you did at the front end to understand the building, understand, understand the, the arena, pardon, pardon the pun, the arena that you're playing within uh, to figure out what kind of technology mix comes into a project like this. Exactly. So we're, we're some of the, a lot of things we're brainstorming at internal workshops we have here in modern right now are, are some of the, um, you know, renewable natural gas, how much that'll play in the future. Um, We're not looking at anything to do with hydrogen yet because I think that's still too far away. But also when you look at places, uh, you know, you mentioned New Brunswick, Alberta, Alberta is a very, very dirty electrical grid. So, you know, it would absolutely change. It's not, you know, where that's in Alberta, electrification is not the answer to things. Not yet. Not yet. It's hard though, right? Yeah, it's hard because we're we're doing projects in Nova Scotia and that's, you know, that you tend to design for the current, but you almost have to, uh, you know, given that these projects can go on for 20, 25 years, and the goal is to green the grid over time, over that time, uh, whether it's with more renewables or more hydro or, or what have you, 
in Nova Scotia, they have some 20, 30, 20, 40 goals to achieve, you know, close to, to zero, uh, you know, zero carbon grid. Yep. You almost have to just bite the bullet and design, you know, with that in mind. And, you know, if you're really concerned with the short term, you could, uh, you could source some renewable electricity, but it's, uh, it is, it does make it more challenging. Like, whereas in Quebec, you know, you simply, we have projects there, you simply switch from natural gas to uh, electricity and then boom, you're net zero, you're, you know, you've got almost zero carbon. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it's interesting as well, when you think about, you know, if somebody's replacing a rooftop unit today and you're replacing a gas fired DX cooling rooftop today and you replace it like for like, you're almost setting yourself up for failure for 2030. Because how do you get off that gas without buying renewable natural gas or offsets? Yeah, yeah. I like some of the heat pumps or some of the rooftops now, they have like dual fuel where yes. heat pump and then the backup is natural gas. So it really uh, you know, limits the amount the natural gas is used. And it's just as an alternative to electric resistance, let's say. Yeah. Uh, again, yeah. I don't know how aggressive we as a society if we have to eliminate natural gas completely or if it's enough to just you know use it strategically for peaking but uh you know that's going to be an interesting question i guess but. yeah yeah that's something we've talked about a lot internally as well as dual fuel uh rooftop units so that if you're replacing one today you might want to think of a dual fuel heat pump as, as you mentioned there mark you know it's mm -hmm. it gives you options 10 years down the road right the the, the, the box is going to be there on the roof for probably you know 13 to 20 years. So yeah, you could always just disable the uh, fuel backup and just stick an electric resistance coil in the, du in the duct if you really want. Exactly. So yeah, you're right. it does. Give you all it's yep. definitely the conundrum that faces many facility owners and operators, right? It's, it's it, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of at the, the tipping, uh, I shouldn't call it a tipping point, but we're certainly at the spot at the place in our, in our evolution in these buildings and our, our decarbonization journey that, it has us having to make key decisions with maybe only half a toolbox full of answers. So it's, it's a tough one. I got a, I got a question though. You know, I, I recognize we're kind of coming up on the 15 minutes guys after the hour and I, and I want to respect everybody's time because even though we're in a pandemic and uh, we don't have commutes, so most of us aren't commuting that uh, we should still respect, uh, you know, the scheduled time. So perhaps just to pull this full circle, I mean, you've, you've done this project. Uh, it, 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 on all accounts, it's, it, it is and will be successful. Uh, it's great to demonstrate this kind of an achievement on a on a on an end use like a rink. Um, you know, they're not they're not as simple as office buildings in a lot of cases, and you know, there's more they're they're more you know more impacted by extreme. But based on the contractor's perspective, because that's really how we've we've angled this particular webinar. You know, could could you tell us you know from your perspective what how, how you feel this could be applied more broadly. Like this isn't just a flash in the pan, is it? Is this something that we can, we can replicate? Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to learn from this and we're trying to learn, uh, we're trying to get real cold, hard data from this as well. And, and, and exactly that, how can we apply this to other facilities? So um, we're talking about rooftop units. Should we be looking at, as we just mentioned, dual fuel rooftop units? What's the advantage to, you know, if you go to a building today and you see six rooftop units on the roof, what's the advantage to putting in a VRF system for those six rooftop units with either backup natural gas or electric resistive heat? So, yes, we're using all the we're going to use all the M&V data we get to drive new initiatives and find out how we can apply that to the broader market. Um, e even the liquid desiccant technology, the biggest, you know, the biggest problem, as I said, was the corrosiveness. The other issue is you can't have any carryover. Like you can't have your liquid desiccant leaving the machine. So that's a big challenge as well. Some big players are trying to, you know, work on that and figure that out because the energy that it takes that we are, um, we're trying to get it in the real live environment, that M&V data, but we're really anxious to learn how many kilowatts are we consuming to remove X pounds of water or latent heat from the system? Because that'll really give us some insight into Again, in Ontario here, it's very humid in the summer. Well, we might be able to dehumidify a lot more cost effectively than the way we're doing it today. If you saw that chart I did where you, you have to drop the temperature down before you can start to evaporate the moisture out of the air. Or sorry, condense the moisture out of the air. I used the wrong word there. But um, 
you know, maybe there's another way that's a little bit more cost effective. Yeah. Like recovery chillers and things like that. Yeah. Even, we're even, we're even thinking of maybe like, it'd be nice if a manufacturer would come up with a liquid desiccant system that would take a portion of the air and deal with the, the latent or the humidity in a very efficient manner, just a part of it. And then use your, use your DX just for sample, uh, sensible cooling, you know, almost might like, uh, those, almost like those multi-path, uh, you know, those air handlers they use in grocery stores, like CES makes them the, the multi-path where the outdoor air portion is treated separately from the rest of the, the air. Okay. I'm not aware of them, but that makes total sense. Yeah. It's called a multi-path, uh, DOAS system, like dedicated, uh, outdoor air system, I think. So hmm. yeah, something you can look into maybe, but that's just for, that's not for dehumidification really, but it, it, it's used in grocery stores for that reason to control humidity. Yeah. With less energy. Yeah. And better control. Yeah. And then, and then the, the, the last one again was it, if you looked at the, the building intelligence system or the integrated building technologies, we really think there's a savings there as well for the environment, you know, right. saving energy and, and constantly monitoring that and, and not doing as many truck rolls. And, you know, our, our, our gut or spidey senses tell us that we can probably do that for a lower total cost than how we're doing it today. Awesome. So I, you know, I, I think this, this is a great conversation, Kevin. Thank, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. You know, a few folks are asking for your contact information. So I, you know, I presume, I presume we are, we're going to be able to send out your deck um, kind of after the, after the show here yeah. uh, to folks and your contact details Absolutely. I suspect can be can be included in that so for anybody who wants to reach out to Kevin and and kind of drive um drive for more um I think that that, that will certainly be uh, be something that is available to you so before we wrap up um I just wanted to plug hold on I'm going to try and share my screen one more time here oh goodness gracious all right do this because we're gonna we're gonna plug uh, our next event, so um, in a, in a couple of months' time, we're we're gonna have another webinar, uh, which is decarbonize building decarbonization and uh, and solar air heating kind of as a kind of as a technology uh, option. So you know, thanks for everybody for coming on today and uh, listening to Kevin speak. Uh, I learned a little bit. Um, I've driven by the Amped facility numerous times. Um, so it's, it's nice to hear a little bit about what's happening inside the building. Um, and certainly I, I really liked seeing that, uh, you know, the solution set, and, and we've learned this in the work that we've done in federal government buildings, the solution set, uh, the solution set that we need to bring to the table to decarbonize isn't, we're not talking about rocket science solutions. We're, we're talking about things that are available to us in the marketplace. There isn't a, a massive premium attached to these systems. It's really about how we plug them together, how we make them make them operate as a as a as a unit or an ecosystem that is driving decarbonization. So, Kevin, I think you've demonstrated that for us. Really, really appreciate that you have. And, uh, and again, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks very much for having me, and thanks to everybody uh, attending. Appreciate it very much, and happy to help anytime. Reach out anytime. Very good. Thanks, Kevin. Thank, thanks, everyone. Have 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 a great Friday. Thank you. Take yeah. care. Bye.